So we're about to take a bit of a mathematical detour into a very uh, light introduction to Lagrangian duality and convex optimization in general, and optimization in general, some of the terminology and some of the techniques. Um, this offers us two things in this class. One, it'll allow us to make a, a proof, a mathematical statement of that equivalence I mentioned last week between the penalization and the constraint form of optimization, the Tikhonov and the Ivanov form. Remember, we had two forms of regularization, one with the hard bound and one with the adding the penalty to the objective function. Lagrangian duality turned out to be the right tool to kind of gain some traction on when exactly are those things equivalent. And it turns out, in most of the situations we deal with, they are. That's one. And the other thing this offers us, we'll get to today, which is some insight into what it is the support vector machine optimization actually gives us. And we'll have some interesting observations to make. Traditionally, Lagrangian duality was taught paired with support vector machines. Uh, so this kind of them coming on the same at the same time is, you know, I learned it this way and I TA'd it this way, you know, going back whatever, 15 years. And there's another reason that they were paired together, which is um, it gave a very nice lead into what we're talking about next week, which is kernel methods and kernelization. But it turns out there's a much lighter and more elegant way to get there than going through Lagrangian duality. So that's no longer one of the reasons for doing this. Uh, but there's still enough other reasons that I think it's worth going through. I drew some things on the board here. Two vectors, x1 and x2 and r2. Right? And I drew a set. I have this new parameter of theta, which ranges between 0 and 1. And then I'm taking this, it's called a convex combination. 1 minus theta times x1 plus theta times x2. And the question is, what is this set? What is this set geometrically, yeah? Yeah, the line segment connecting x1 and x2. What happens when, x is, when theta is 0? Yeah, when theta is 0, we get x1. So that's here. And when theta is 1, we get x2. And as theta varies between 0 and 1, we get different combinations of 0 and 1. Yeah, so. It's this set of points. This, it's a set of vectors in R2. So it's fine. So we'll use this in the slides. All right, so just a very uh, cartoonish history of optimization. So historically, there's a lot of focus on linear programs, linear programming. Um, things like linear objectives and linear constraints. And those are the problems that we knew how to solve efficiently. Things like simplex method were, were our best methods historically. Um, now there are better things. And so there are linear programs and then nonlinear programs. And people research nonlinear programs, but um, you know, some they, people knew how to solve easily and some people didn't know how to solve easily. And that was kind of the divide. And then eventually kind of a different partition arose and it hit kind of machine learning community in the early 2000s, which is this notion that the, 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 the better distinction, rather than linear versus nonlinear, was convex versus non-convex. And there's a whole bunch of research, kind of late 90s, early 2000s, on kind of knocking off convex problems one after the next until we were pretty confident that we knew how to solve most convex problems efficiently, some definition of efficient. And so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of excitement about what types of problems can you, what, how can you map a machine learning problem to a convex optimization problem, and then we can use this machinery from convex optimization to, to crank out a solution, almost like with a black box. Um, but uh, you know, when you started getting these large data sets, most of the methods in convex optimization were these batch methods where you use, you, know, your, you don't think about your objective function as an average over lots of training data, you just consider it a function. In which case, if you have a ton of training data, then as we spoke about in the first lecture, if you're doing, like for instance, gradient descent, it's computationally really intense because you have to touch every single one of your data points. So we started talking about stochastic methods. And stochastic methods kind of hit mainstream machine learning in like not that long ago, uh, maybe 2010 or something. Now, it's not that people didn't know stochastic gradient descent methods. They absolutely knew them for quite some time. It just no one had kind of realized that they were as they could be as effective as as we as we see they are now. Um, 
not no one, but kind of most machine learning practitioners. So more recently, so what is, what's going on here? I mean, a lot of it is things we've discussed, which is that maybe these stochastic gradient methods don't hit the optimal as quickly as a gradient method, but the, the, the speed improvement of the gradient method is really getting those last decimal places of accuracy on your optimum, which when you look at those trade-offs between optimization error and estimation error and approximation error, those last kind of full few decimal places of, of, of optimality you can get from gradient descent versus stochastic gradient descent are dwarfed by the errors of estimation error and approximation error. And so it turns out to be kind of irrelevant. And so, yeah, in recent times, stochastic methods have kind of been accepted as especially useful for large data sets. And then on the convexity side, yeah, these days people aren't really scared of non-convex optimization in practice. These neural networks are certainly non-convex, and stochastic gradient descent seems to work quite well with them. And so that's kind of the state of things today. Now people are really diving in to find um, optimization methods that are very specific for machine learning objective functions. Uh, if you want to get into convex optimization, there's kind of this classic, now classic book uh, from the early 2000s. The notation is uh, good, but a slightly unusual. And I'll just make a few points here of where they, um, where you might be a little surprised. Uh, I've written a what I call an extreme abridgment of Boyd and Vandenberg, which is basically I've collected all the definitions and theorems that you need to understand Lagrangian duality, which we're talking about today, into something like 10 or 12 pages. And you kind of have to do that because if you use this book to learn Lagrangian duality, you have to go through like 300 pages because uh, of the order that they developed the, the chapters. So um, kind of extreme abridgment is like a subset of the book. I didn't write it. I didn't write new material, really. The notation that's a little unusual, when they, in the book, write f what, what I would read as f maps from rp to rq, what they really mean is that it maps from some subset of rp to some, and they'll write that as the domain of f. Uh, in our case, we always map from the entire input space. So this is irrelevant. I just want to let you know that if you, if you read the book and you see this, uh, this is what they're talking about. So the function may only be defined on some subset of rp, and they'll denote that dom of f. All right. So to get into convex optimization, we actually have to start with convex sets and convex functions, which is like the first 100 pages of Boyd and Vandenberg. But um, here I've drawn two sets. Uh, so the sets are these outlines and the interior. And here, this outline and the interior. And uh, kind of geometrically, a set is convex. If you take any two points in the set, connect them by the line segment, and the entire line segment, if the entire line segment stays in the set, then it's convex. This example, we have two points. We connected them by a line. The line exits the set, not convex. Mathematically, uh, just wrote down this expression here for this is a this is a particular point between x1 and x2. As theta varies between 0 and 1, we need this point to be in the set for all values of theta for it to be a convex set. Right. Any questions on convex sets? Yeah, I think the geometric approach is, a, is an easy one. Uh, convex functions are a little, bit, a little bit more difficult, but still fairly easy. Convex functions, geometrically, you think of things that are cup-shaped. You know, they could hold water. They like this. So, uh, so in some, in some, uh, I think in some treatments they're called concave up and concave down. I think when I first learned about this, that was the terminology. But that's not very, uh, it's not very. Is that what you said? That's messed up. <laughs> I'm not judgmental. I'm just saying there is a less common terminology that says up or down. If it's up, that's maybe it's easier to remember. Anyway, so what this is about is if you choose. If, our if the graph of our function is this para parabola looking thing, and you take two points of the input domain x and y, and then you look at their values on the function, and you, if you connect the 
points on the, on the graph of the function by a line segment, that line segment should lie above the function. All right, that would be kind of the geometric understanding of convexity. So this would not be a convex function because you take this point and this point on the graph, you connect them, the function crosses. Okay. So a concave function is a function whose negative is convex. Okay. So this is, is this concave, convex, or neither? The second one. It's neither. Right. Good. All right. So you often need to know if a function is convex. And the recipe here is you have basically two paths. One is use the definition and you work it out, and just prove it to yourself. I mean, it's easy. To, if you can visualize it, you can kind of make a guess pretty easily by plotting it. In very high dimensions, you can't visualize it very easily. So you're going to need some, some math. So you can either use this approach, or more commonly, you just get a collection of examples of convex functions. So here's linear functions. Affine functions are convex. Use these polynomial powers are convex. e to the ax is convex for any a norms, et cetera. And then there's different ways to combine convex functions and linear functions and affine functions to make new convex functions. And so when you're trying to figure out if a function is convex, your best bet is to go to a book that lists a lot of convex functions and ways to combine them to get new ones and work, on it, work it out that way. Strict convexity is a good term to know. This is if the line segment connecting any two points lies strictly above the function. So a line is not, a linear function is not strictly convex, okay, but it's convex. Also concave. So the consequences for optimization is that if you have a convex function, any local minima are also global minima. Right? If it's strictly convex, Global minima are unique. Okay. So any local minima, then it's the unique global minimum. Good. All right. Any questions? Just setting out some basic terminology. Yeah. Since you, you just mentioned how you can frame like um, convex and concave functions in terms of one another as, as the negative. Yeah. Um, so we're not worried about getting, like everyone talks about convex functions, but we wouldn't be afraid if someone gave us a concave one, right? We would then just take the minus of it. And yeah, so if, if the problem were to maximize a concave function, that's equivalent to minimizing a convex function. If someone wanted to minimize a concave function, that's trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the concave function uh, match the definition of a uh, convex function, right? Because any, you would take two points, any, any point in the middle on the line would be? Yeah, the function would be above every point. On the segment connect. So the convex uh, required uh, the middle point to be above, above. Yeah. So a concave function would look like this. Let's see if you connect this and this. This is below the function. Yeah. All right. So we're now going to talk about some standard forms for optimization. These are useful just to know about because usually this or something related are the forms that software takes in. Right. Often you'll you'll end up with an optimization problem. And if you want to plug it into some optimizer, you have to get into some form. So here's the forms that we're talking about. The most general optimization form we'll discuss, we'll write like this. So we have some objective function f0 of x. And we have these constraints on x. And we write this, we have these inequality constraints. So we have these other functions, fi of x. And we want fi of x to be less than or equal to 0. And then we have these equality constraints, hi of x. Right? And the x, they're called the optimization variables. The domain, this is now a very Boyd and Vandenberg specific thing. So each of these functions in great generality could have different sets that they're defined on. And we're talking about the domain of the problem as the intersection of all those domains. But this is not something that we need to worry about. But we'll assume that it's not empty. Okay. So the set of, so here's some more terminology. Set of points that satisfy all the constraints all these constraints, instead of all x that obey all these subject to constraints, that's called feasible set. Right? A point in that set is called a feasible point. So we'll talk about these feasible. 
regions and these sorts of things. So another thing that will come up later today is that suppose we have a feasible, po feasible point x. It obeys all the inequality constraints and inequality inequality and equality constraints. And remember, F's, Fi's were the inequality constraints. The H's were the equalities. So if Fi of x is equal to 0, we only require that it be less than or equal to 0. But if, if x is actually equal to 0, the constraint is like tight. And what we'll say is that the constraint is active at x. right? So suppose. Is that clear? Well, so if f2 of, suppose this region represents f2 of x less than or equal to 0, right? So this is, this is one of the constraint regions. So if a point is right on the boundary, which would be f2 of x is equal to 0, we say that this constraint is active at this point x. OK, and the optimal value of a problem p is the smallest objective value function we can attain over all x's that satisfy all the constraints. It's very natural. Okay. And x star, so p star is the optimal value of the problem. x star, that's where the optimal value is actually attained. So x star is an optimal point or solution to the optimization problem if it's a feasible point and also it attains the optimal value. Right? Sorry, I know these definitions can be a little tiring, but let's just get them out there and move on. So first thought question, do we need the equality constraints at all? And as I think you see, you don't really, because you can always write an equality constraint equal to 0 in terms of two inequality constraints, all right? greater than or equal to 0 and less than or equal to 0. So there's other reasons for convenience. You might want to pull out the equality constraints. But for our purposes, it's sufficient to, we don't really leverage that. And so we're just going to deal with inequality constraints. And you should feel comfortable with that, because you can always convert an equality constraint to inequality constraints. All right. All right. Let me go to here. So now we're going to talk about Lagrangian duality. And I want to highlight, even in the title slide, that for this portion of the talk, we don't actually need convexity. This is independent of convexity. So I think Lagrangians are pretty cool, even without getting to Lagrangian duality. The Lagrangian itself is, is interesting. So first, let's define it. So at the top, we've written down this general inequality constrained optimization problem. Minimize f0, subject to these less than or equal to 0 constraints. No assumptions about convexity or anything like that. The definition, the Lagrangian you get a Lagrangian for an optimization problem. So given this optimization problem in this specific standard form, right, the Lagrangian is defined as following. It's a function of x, where x is the kind of the variable we're optimizing over in the problem, plus this new vector of variables, lambda. And the Lagrangian is the original objective function f0 of x, plus this new thing. This new thing is a linear combination of the constraint functions, the fi's, with weights lambda i. Okay? So the lambda i's are called Lagrange multipliers. They're also called dual variables, which we'll see when we take the dual. And that's it. That's the definition of the Lagrangian. But what's really cool about the Lagrangian is it, in, in some sense, encodes the entire optimization problem in this one function. So I want to expose that right now. So the claim is that if you take this Lagrangian function and you take the supremum over lambda, where each entry, lambda is a vector, right? And each entry of lambda, so the lambda i's, if you constrain that to be greater than or equal to 0, the supremum, you guys remember what supremum is? It's like maximum, but it could be unbounded. So any set has a, a supremum. It could be infinite. Um, Okay. So the claim is that the supremum over the Lagrangian, in some sense, gives us back the original problem. So what, what could I mean by that? Let's consider some different values of x. Suppose I have an x that um, violates 
an inequality constraint. All right? So let's suppose x violates the f1 inequality constraint. So what does that mean about f1 of x? That's right. Because the inequality constraints in our standard form were all of the form fi of x is less than or equal to 0. So if it violates it, that means fi of x is greater than 0. All right? So suppose fi of, let's say f1 of x. Suppose f1 of x is greater than 0. What happens to the supremum of lambda greater than or equal to 0? OK, it's infinity. So let's, let's you see why it's infinity. Yeah, so f I, if f1 of x is something, anything non-negative, we could take the corresponding lambda as large as we want towards infinity, and that makes this whole expression infinite. Okay? So if, any, if x violates any inequality, is that unclear? Any questions on that? If x violates any inequality constraint, the supremum is infinity. And what happens if x is, satisfies all inequality constraints? So it is in the feasible set. What happens then? This point is lambda is 0. The supremum has lambda equal to 0. Why is that? So each of the fi of x's is less than or equal to 0. Um, but we want this whole expression to be as large as possible. So if these things are negative, we want lambda i. What value of lambda do we want? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, we'd want this thing to be positive, but we can't. That would require lambda i to be negative, because the negative times the negative is positive. But we're constrained to lambda being non-negative. So the best we can do is set this term to 0 by setting lambda i to 0. So the supremum over this, yeah, has lambda equal to 0 for each of these lambda i's. And then what's the value of that supremum in that case? f0 of x. So if x satisfies all the inequality constraints, so all these fi of x's are less than or equal to 0, then the supremum has lambda identically 0, which sends this linear combination to 0. And then we're left with f0 of x. All right, so we've just basically solved this optimization problem. And we have two cases. One is that x is in the feasible set, in which case this is just f0 of x. And otherwise, it's infinite. So do you see what I mean by this Lagrangian basically captures the entire optimization problem? What do we do next to actually write the optimization problem in terms of this. Yeah, we want it right, exactly. So if we minimize this whole thing over x, say in femum, uh, what happens, what's the infimum when x is, uh, right, so will we ever end up with infinite for, this, for the in for the soup? Okay. No, because Infinity will never be the solution to the, in, to the minimization problem. So because this objective, this whole function is infinite whenever x is not in the feasible set, we'll never, never select that x because the function value is infinite. So you can always do better by choosing x in the feasible set. So the bottom line is that the p star, that's the solution to the optimization, the value of the optimization problem is equal to the infimum over x of this expression, so the inf of a soup. All right, so we've re-expressed our original optimization problem in terms of Lagrangian, kind of a minimization of a maximization, a constrained maximization. And that's called the primal form. That's an expression of the primal form optimization problem. And then now we can very easily describe what the dual is, the dual optimization problem which you may not have heard before, but I'm hearing about it now. So the dual is attained just by swapping the inf and the soup. That's it. That's the dual optimization problem. So we change the order of the minimizing and the maximizing. And this gives the dual optimization problem. And we can call the, the solution to that the value, the optimal value d star. It's called the dual optimal. And in general, p star and d star may not be the same. But in, our, in many scenarios that we deal with, they are exactly the same. Uh, that's called strong duality. And what we'll find is that this dual problem, it's, because it's an equivalent optimization problem, we're free to work with this dual optimization problem. And what we'll find is often 
interesting properties about the solution will be revealed by working with the dual that we would, could not easily see by working with just in the primal form. And we'll see some of this uh, for support vector machines. So this is kind of the motivation sometimes for going to the dual uh, if, if they're equivalent. So we don't always have strong duality, but we always have what's called a weak duality. And that's that P star is always at least as large as D star. Um, the way I remember that is um, kind of, it's what you do first. So the inner, the inner optimization is kind of the first thing you do, and then the outer. And it's what you do first that kind of counts more. So if you're doing the supremum first, you're going to end up with things that are the biggest of their group, and then you're minimizing. And so that you're going to end up with something that's larger than if you do the infimum first. That's just kind of a, so look to the inside first. That's how I remember the order for weak duality. You guys have some energy for a one-page proof? Two line. It's, uh, I think it's pretty neat. It's amazingly simple, um, and yet somehow not obvious to me. So we're proving this weak duality, and we're framing it now in an extremely general case. So we have a, an arbitrary function from, the, from w cross z to reals. No constraints on f at all. No constraints on w or z. Uh, they could be any sets. They could be discrete. They could be continuous. These are it's a truly arbitrary. It's a truly general setting. Um, and this is the claim: the soup inf is less than or equal to the inf soup of f. Let's see what we can do. So let's start. I'm going to go to the board here for a sec. Let's choose any w zero, z zero. W0 and W, Z0 and Z. And let's write uh, this function value f of W0, Z0. So what we're writing is the most trivial thing, basically. If we take this Z0 and we, and we optimize over it, we, instead of Z0, we, we look for the soup over all possible Zs in in the set of FW0Z, then this inequality is clearly true, right? We're, we're taking Z0 and in, we're allowing ourselves to replace it. We're searching over all possible values of Z for what's the biggest. And of course, the result will be larger than just using Z0, because Z0 was one of the possible things we were searching over. Similarly, if we do the infimum over w and w, we'll have the inequality on the other side. All right. Any questions on this? So this is, I've almost, I've done almost nothing. We've, we've, of, of course, the optima, optimization over one of those variables will be at least as large or at least as small as any arbitrarily chosen one. Let's bring these two things together. So info of w of f of w z0. And then that's, of course, less than or equal to the soup of z. I'm just literally just rewriting right now. I just rewrote leaving out the middle one. Have I written something wrong? That's where it's C. Thank you. Yes, great. Good now? All right. So this inequality is true for any arbitrary w0 and z0. All right. So it's true for any arbitrary w0 and z0. It should be true. It will be true also for the supremum over z0s on the left and the infimum over w0s on the right. Because it's true for all z0s and w0s. Well, so if we take this and we just throw the supremum over z0 on the left, which we can do because it's true for all z0s, and the same infimum over w0 on the right, then we get the claim. Now, you might say, well, can you really, is it really OK to do a supremum over infimum? If this were a strict inequality, you, you can't do that because the supremum might hit 
the limit point, but bless you. But with less than or equal to, then you can certainly add the soup and the in like this. I think it's cool in its simplicity. Yeah? Question? All right. So this is called a weak maximum inequality. This is exactly, this is a more general setting even than we have here. But inf soup is greater than or equal to the soup inf. That's it. That gives us the weak duality. Always true. Strong duality, we need some more. So just a little bit more terminology. The gap between P star and D star, sometimes called the duality gap. Um, and of course, we have strong duality by definition if P star is equal to D star. Okay. So we now have the ingredients to define the Lagrange. So we have, uh, basically, we've def said what the Lagrangian dual problem is, but there's a little bit more terminology to extract from it. So this is the Lagrangian dual problem. So our objective function is this inner piece. We could, th we could look at this as a maximization problem over lambda. And this inner piece is just a function of lambda. Right? So the inner piece is called the Lagrange dual function, or just the dual function. And it's a function of lambda. We'll write it g of lambda. And it is this infimum piece, infimum over x. So of course, Lagrangian has x and lambda. But when you take the infimum over x, the x goes away. And if we plug in the expression for the Lagrangian, we're back here. So the Lagrange dual is the infimum over x of the Lagrangian. All right. And then, OK, details. Uh, you can show that the dual function is always concave. It's interesting. I don't want to go into the details of that. But you can use kind of the techniques that I was telling you. You'll want to look up this notion that the minimum of affine functions is concave. OK. So one quick perspective on this, what's the use of this Lagrange dual function? One thing is that you can think of, uh, you could think of weak duality as giving you like a lower bound on your optimal value. Because the dual function, g of lambda, we know that the optimal dual is soup over lambda of the dual. So that's d star. We know d star gives a lower bound on p star. So if you plug in any lambda, we're going to get some other lower bound, maybe not as good on p star. So you could think about, you could think about this expression as saying the dual optimization problem is finding the best lower bound on your objective function. A little bit more terminology. So lambda is called dual feasible if uh, it satisfies the constraints that lambda is not negative. And we also want, so there's kind of like an implicit uh, constraint, which is that the objective function should be not negative infinity. It's kind of a, an implicit constraint, which kind of is natural if you're trying to maximize um, g of lambda that it won't end up at negative infinity anyway. But for lambda, the definition of dual feasible uh, asks that g lambda be not negative infinity. So why are we doing this Lagrangian thing? There's various reasons. Uh, one is that the dual problem is often simpler. So for instance, uh, before, our, our original constraints were things of the form an arbitrary function is less than or equal to 0. But in the dual problem, the constraints are there are no functions in the constraints. This is just lambda. Lambda is a raw variable. And we ask that lambda be non-negative. So the constraints have gotten a lot simpler in the, in the dual problem. Now, the, all the, a lot of complexity has been pushed into the dual, op, the dual function. But you know, maybe that's OK. Net-net, um, it might be easier to deal with. OK. All right. So everything we've said about these definitions of Lagrangians these are arbitrary. They don't require any uh, convexity of the function or smoothness or anything at all. And now we'll push in a little bit more to convex optimization. So convex optimization problem has the same standard form, but now we require that each of these f's be convex. Okay. 
And usually, we're going to have strong duality. Uh, here's an example you can look at sometime if you're interested, where it's a convex optimization problem that you don't have strong duality for. Um, but usually, you have strong duality for a convex optimization problem, which is nice. Uh, but we, you know, we have some technical conditions that, there are, there are, that are called constraint qualifications for whatever reason. And the one that's easiest to use is called Slater's constraint qualification, which is, gives you sufficient conditions for strong duality in a convex problem. Uh, roughly speaking, the conditions say that the problem needs to be strictly feasible. What that means is that in your problem, there's at least one point that satisfies all of your constraints with strict inequality. Right? So usually the constraints are form fi of x less. These are the, this is the form of the constraint. And remember, if fi of x is equal to 0, it's called a, an active constraint. Right? So there has to be some point in the domain that, for which none of the constraints are active. So that's called strictly feasible. It's, it satisfies all these constraints with strict inequality. All right, so if you could find such a point, then the problem is called strictly feasible. And that's, roughly speaking, that's a sufficient condition for um, strong duality. So it turns out that if your problem domain is an open set, which will be for us always, uh, I believe, then strict feasibility is sufficient. But you can even lighten that constraint a bit. So if, if fi of x is an affine function, so Instead of, so this might be the constraint set for a general convex function. But if we have these kind of half planes, this is an affine constraint. It's an affine function with an inequality. Then it turns out we don't even need strict feasibility. Feasibility is enough for those constraints. I know this is a lot of tedious detail. It's just that we're going to use each of these things for the support vector machine. I haven't added anything that we are not going to need. All right, last piece. Uh, this, is, this is cool. We'll, we'll prove it. It's an easy proof. And this is the thing that's going to give us all the insight for the support vector machines. It's called complementary slackness. You guys heard of this? Four people. OK, good. So back to general optimization problem. We don't need convexity here. So if we have strong duality, we get this very interesting relationship between the optimal Lagrange multipliers and the constraints they remember for every constraint we had a Lagrange multiplier. So there's a relationship between the optimal Lagrange multipliers, the solutions to the dual optimization problem, and the optimum of the primal problem. It's called complementary slackness, which is that basically at least one of them is zero, because their product needs to be zero. And of course, if fi of x star is 0, that's, that has a term that's the active constraint. Yeah? Uh, is it not that fi of x should be less than 0 for the strong duality always? No. fi of x uh, star needs to be less than or equal to 0. Oh, you're, you're referring to the Slater's condition. So it's not that, so that's, that's a very good question. So Slater's condition doesn't require that x star have strict inequality. It requires that there be at least one point in the domain, in the feasible set, that is strictly feasible. So we're going to prove something. We're going to prove this here. So let x star be a primal optimal and lambda star be the dual optimal. So the solutions to the primal and the dual problem, right? So f0, that's our objective function for the primal. g, that's our dual objective function. We've plugged in the corresponding optimal values. and. First, let's write this. This should be trivial. By, let's see, by definition of, let's see, let me see. OK. So this first equality is strong duality, right? The second piece is the definition of, what is the definition of? Dual function. Definition of the dual function, right. Great. Remember, g is the info over x of the Lagrangian. So that's the definition of dual. Okay. 
Now we can do the same type of inequality trick we did for min max, which was the infimum over x of Lx of lambda star must be less than or equal to L of x star lambda star, because infimum should be at least as small as another point you plug in. So we could say it's less than or equal to x star of lambda star. Great. Now let's unpack the definition of Lagrangian. So it's the primal objective plus this linear combination of the constraints. And remember, for it to be feasible, we, need, we would have fi of x star less than or equal to 0, always. Um, and we know lambda i of star, of course, is going ah, one sec. These are, yeah, lambda i star is greater than or equal to 0. So this product is less than or equal to 0. Great, thank you. OK. And then this whole thing is less than or equal to 0. So of course, the expression is less than or equal to f0 of x star. This is great. So now we have this sandwich thing, because we have f0 of, f0 of x star is less than or equal to f0 of x star, which means they're all equals, actually. Right? Which means we can go back here and say, this thing must be 0. And if the sum is actually 0, and each piece is less than or equal to 0, then we know in detail that every individual sum n must be 0. Because you can't have pluses and minuses canceling each other out to be 0, because they're all negative or, non, or non-positive. So we know each of these products is 0. Lambda i star, f i star. <laughs> yeah, and that is complementary slackness. <laughs> 